Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. All right. Uh, this week's edition of the Nipua Banner and Press is dated Friday, October the 13th, 2023. On the front page this week, there is a beautiful prairie harvest sun sunrise picture. This photo sent in by Leah Sumner was taken on October the 7th, while combines and swathers were out in her family's fields. The photo was taken just southwest of Nipua. Beautiful. <clears throat> Stellar Apparel of Nipua hosted grand opening September the 29th and 30th by Casper Werhon. Nipua's newest business marked its grand opening recently. Stellar Apparel, located at 243 Hamilton Street, celebrated the occasion on September 29th and 30th. This brand new men's and women's boutique is run by mother-daughter duo Tammy Atke, the owner, and Annika Atke, the manager. This occasion sure was a grand feeling for the pair. Formerly the location of the Nipua Banner and Press, also Hamilton Street Emporium, Work was needed to, in order to update and convert the space to suit their needs. Tammy said it was a lot of work, but it feels good to see the vision come to life. It's a nice accomplishment. The long-standing building has been refurbished with fresh coats of paint on the exterior and interior, new flooring installed and more. With these updates complete, the boutique is new home to a variety of everyday essentials. It's things you need in your closet year round, and we carry a bit of workwear as well, said Annika. One of our goals was to try and keep people shopping in town and to provide as many Canadian made products as possible. Tammy added, it's like a big city feel in a small town. The more we can get people staying here or coming to shop here, the more they are going to spend at businesses throughout the town. We love our small towns and schools and we need to support them. Big city shops, the pair stated, also tend to have all the same items. In contrast, Stellar Apparel is bringing in unique clothing and item brands such as Koala, Pika and Bear, Epic Blend, Odessa and Lola Jeans. You aren't going to find these brands in the big city, said Annika. In their final comments, the pair also shed some light on how they came to name the business Stellar Apparel. The mother-daughter duo told the Banner and Press they had explored a variety of options. Stellar Apparel is one we always came back to, said Tammy. It really stood out to us and it highlights the quality of the goods we offer. Annika added, and with it being a boutique for both men's and women's wear, it's unisex enough that either a man or a woman could be drawn in by it. Stellar Apparel is open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Congratulations are extended to the Atke family on their business's grand opening. And here's a picture of uh, mother-daughter trio. It's hard to tell who's who, but this is the mother, Tammy, and the daughter, Annika. And here's a little picture of a portion of the uh, store inside. 
showing its wares. So good luck to them. Now, there is a harvest celebration coming up Thursday, October the 19th. It's called Nipua Businesses Open Late. So Thursday, October the 19th from 5 to 8 p.m. There's going to be a free movie at the Roxy Theater sponsored by the Rotary Club of Nipua. There's going to be the Nipua Library book sale and marketplace. There is going to be kids activities at the courthouse sponsored by Nipua Gladstone Co-op and also a hot chocolate fundraiser at the courthouse. So this is all being put on from the by the Nipuan District Chamber of Commerce. So make sure to write that down and, and try to attend. Also coming up at the Roxy Theatre eh, on October the 13th and 14th at 7.30 p.m., a movie called Blue Beetle, an alien scarab chooses Jamie Ray's to be its symbolic host, bestowing the recent college graduate with a suit of armor that's capable of extraordinary powers, forever changing his destiny as he becomes the superhero known as Blue Beetle. And it's a PG movie. The weekend after is The Equalizer 3. And also coming up at Arts Forward is Comedy Night with Matt Falk, October 27th at 7.30 at Arts Forward. Tickets are $20. Advanced tickets are available at Arts Forward or online at Kaleidoscope Concert Series slash tickets html. The show sponsors are Gill and Schmall Agencies. So a comedy night at Arts Forward, October the 27th at 7.30, featuring the comedian named Matt Falk. Come back to that. All right, Helen Drysdale. This week, uh, out of Helen's Kitchen, it is entitled Cranberries. Cranberries are synonymous with Thanksgiving and Christmas. I love them all year long. Cranberries are native to northeastern North America. The European settlers to North America found they were familiar with most of the berries they came across, but the cranberries they found growing in the wild on long running vines in sandy bogs and marshes were unknown to them. The indigenous people for years had used cranberries as a source of food, dye and medicine. Eaten in many ways, one was to pound them into pemmican which served as a great source of nutrition for winter or to carry while traveling, perhaps a forerunner to the energy bar. Huh. In 1663, the Pilgrim Cookbook appears with a recipe for cranberry sauce to be served with the turkey at Thanksgiving. Wow, 1663. The American cranberry has been cultivated and farmed since the early 1800s, but was not available in a can until 1912. Lawyer Marcus Uran revolutionized the industry when he bought a cranberry bog and decided to grow and can cranberries. He formed a cranberry cooperative with, an, with other cranberry producers that eventually was renamed Ocean Spray. The Ocean Spray Company now includes over 700 grower families across North and South America. Cranberries have many health benefits, such as helping prevent urinary tract infections and help cure ulcers. They also contain vitamins and minerals like vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin K, and manganese. They're a powerhouse of antioxidants and are thought to help in the prevention of certain types of cancer, improved immune function, and decreased blood pressure. 
the USA produces the most cranberries in the world, while Canada comes second with 163,812 tons as a yearly production. Cranberries are raised in beds on sandy soil in bogs or marshy land. During harvest, the cranberry beds are flooded. Harvested cranberries float in the water and can be corralled into a corner of the bed and gathered up. From the farm, cranberries are taken to receiving stations where they are cleaned, sorted and stored until ready to pack or process. While cranberries are harvested when a red color, but can also be harvested beforehand when they are still white, which is how white cranberry juice is made. Only about 5% of cranberries are sold fresh, while the rest are turned into cranberry juice, sauce, and dried. But the sweet tart berry can also be used for so much more. Cranberries are wonderful in appetizers, salads, savory dishes, and desserts. Cranberry squares or muffins, anyone? So her two recipes this week are cranberry squares and yummy lemon cranberry muffins. Next, we have a pro, uh, an article about a federal program helping with homes in Nipua by Owen Devereaux. Nipua has taken a closer look at a new federal program that will help fast track the construction of more housing. On Tuesday, October the 3rd, Councillor Daryl Gerard discussed with the mayor and other members of council the findings of a local study looking into the National Housing Accelerator Fund. The fund is a $4 billion initiative that was first announced in the 2022 federal budget, but for which applications were not being accepted until recently. The money made available to communities would increase the number of housing builds by helping cover the cost of the necessary infrastructure, such as water, sewer, and roads. Gerard noted that for Nipawa, those funds could assist the town and developers with new single-family apartment developments and affordable housing projects. In order to apply for the program, a community must have a housing study in place. Gerard said that requirement has recently been met by the town through work completed by the Governance and Finance Co Committee. He added that if Nipua does qualify, they could receive up to $4.9 million. Wow. I think that we are well positioned with just how Nipua has been growing and we can show our growth as a community has been exponential compared to other communities of like size. We've shown that we have planned in advance by developing these studies, said Gerard who expressed optimism that Nipua would be approved. Last month, London, Ontario became the first community to sign a deal under the Accelerator Fund and received $74 million to help with the construction of 2,000 new homes. The city of Vaughan, Ontario also received, recently received $59 million to incentivize new housing construction. All right, Rural Outlook. Uh, the first uh, article, Nipua Local Receives Stunning Opportunity by Casper Wareham. A Nipua Local is stepping up for a first time honor in his musical career. Blair Chapman, the individual in question, was announced as a director for the Westman Youth Choir last month, also known as WMYC. Chapman is well known in the community for his prior role as a teacher at NACI with involvement in the literary arts, choirs and musical productions. The Westman Youth Choir is made up of students from the Westman area who are currently in grades 10 through 12 with students at the end of their grade 9 year being welcome to audition. I've sent singers to the 
WMYC every year that I taught high school. Anywhere between seven or eight Nipua students have participated in this choir, Chapman told the Banner and Press on October the 5th. Initially, I was stunned. I never imagined that I would be given this opportunity. Since Chapman's appointment as director, he has been working hard with the choir. Most recently, Chapman and the students completed a series of two musical camps. We had a rehearsal weekend at Camp Wanna Come Back, and it was an amazing experience, Chapman enthused. On Friday and Saturday, we probably sang for about 10 hours each day, starting at nine in the morning and ending at nine at night. And during the breaks, the kids grab a guitar or head for a piano and sing something together. We like them to take a break, but we're just in such a musical environment, it just keeps going. Chapman added, this past weekend, we had to pick people to, to sing solos. And that was tough because they all sing so well. So you just listen for the voice that seems to match the piece. Chapman explained further, making note of the size of the group. In total, there are 53 students to choose from. Of this number, four of them are Nipua students this year. Siri Wurwak, Sheen Kalamba, C.J. Santos and Trent Tomanico. The 53-person cap is in correspondence with the number of seats available on the bus that the YM Youth Choir uses. It can be pretty tight some years. This year we had around 80 or 90 students auditioned for the choir. I'm glad that someone else has to make those decisions because it would have been pretty tough. The hard work of Chapman and the 53 students on this year's choir is now behind them, with the group gearing up for their tour of West Man. The tour begins this weekend with performances taking place at the Minidosa United Church on October the 14th, Nipua United Anglican Church on October 16th, and the First Presbyterian Church in Brandon on October 17th. Each of these performances will take place at 7.30 p.m. The goal is to have a good audience for the kids, to hear them all singing. As a director, you have the best seat in the house, right in front of them. And it just sounds spectacular, said Chapman. It's a really strong group, so I hope everyone has a great evening if they are able to come. Nice. Next, we have uh, Greg Nesbitt, honored by re-election in Riding Mountain by Casper Verhan. While last week's election saw the NDP take home the provincial majority, progressive conservative candidates took the stage on the local level. As Agassiz candidate Jody Byram celebrated her own win, that celebration was echoed by fellow PC representative Greg Nesbitt in the Riding Mountain district. Nesbitt successfully secured 63.9% of the district's votes with the NDP coming up second, 31.7%, and Liberal in third place, 4.4%. I was very honoured to be elected for a third term as the MLA for Riding Mountain, said Nesbitt. I look forward to representing all my constituents over the next four years. Nesbitt added, while the results provincially weren't what I had hoped, I am proud to be a part of a PC team that will hold the NDP government's feet to the fire. Our caucus is comprised of many veteran MLAs as well as fresh faces like Jody Byram of Agassiz. In addition to Nesbitt's experience as MLA for Riding Mountain, he has previously served as the legislative assistant to the Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living. He has also held a variety of other leadership roles such as being a founding member of the Shoal Lake Regional Airport Authority and as a volunteer firefighter for the Shoal Lake Fire Department. And here we have a picture of Greg Nisbet right here. And I forgot to mention with the, the last uh, uh, article that I wrote that this is a picture of Blair Chapman, who was recently announced as the director for the Westman Youth Choir. Supporting the Local Arts 
Nipua Tourism presented Arts Forward with a check of $2,630 recently. The funds were raised via the admission for the 2023 Riverbend Market and will be used for added programming within the community for all ages. So here we have pictured Pam Brown present, presented the che check on behalf of tourism to Heidi Nugent, Arts Forward's new administrator. And here we have another check being presented entitled Kinsman Courts to Donates to Nipua Community Ministries Food Bank by Owen Devereaux. We should be thankful today for the generosity of spirit that lives in the hearts of residents and staff at Kinsman Courts 2, or KK2 as we call it, in Nipua. That generosity was showcased recently through a donation to our local food bank. On Tuesday, October the 10th, KK2 Executive Director Dana Menzies presented a check for $500 to Nipua Community Ministries Food Bank Program. The money was raised through KK2's recent Thanksgiving meal fundraiser. We had over 100 guests for our Thanksgiving meal between Sunday and Monday. And with the revenue we generated from that meal, we wanted to give back to the Salvation Army as they have given donations to us. So. We just wanted to pay it back, said Menzies. Amanda Nottingale, the director for Nipua Community Ministries, said, We appreciate this donation from KK2 as they prepare for a hectic holiday season. Anyone who wishes to, to donate cash, non-perishable food items, or household supplies can do so at the, at the Salvation Army Nipua Community Ministries location in Nipua at 342 Mountain Avenue. So here we have the picture of Amanda Nottingale. She's the Community Ministries Director. She's accepting a check for $500 from Kinsman Courts to Executive Director Dana Menzies. MMH to host Trauma and Grief Presentation by Casper Werhon. MMH, known for Miles for Mental Health, is welcoming all to attend a public presentation for Trauma and Grief on October the 26th. The event has no fee and is open to all ages while child attendance via parental discretion as sensitive subject matter is included. The structure of the event will be fairly informal with refreshments available. The guest speaker for the evening is Susan Rabichuk, RSW, BA, MSW, PhD, C. Rabichuk is a retired police officer who is now a social worker via private practice. Susan has done extensive work with communities that have experienced sudden tragedies like the bus crash at Carberry. I believe she worked with the community in Carberry at the time, said MMH board member Diane Martin. And there were at least two suicides in Carberry over the last couple of years, so she has acted as a consultant, a support individual. Martin added, I've not met Susan myself, but Claire McCannell, who is on the Miles for Mental Health board as well, has worked with her on various committees, and she came forward with the idea of inviting Susan to come here. The idea for this evening also sparked from internal conversations with the board to find more ways to benefit as many individuals as possible. We all feel the pain of some of the recent traumatic e events, but at the same time, we all have our own experiences, whether they be family or friends, said Martin. Susan will speak for three-ish minutes and discuss in the particular way that she does this particular topic, which is not an easy one to talk about. Martin added, Claire has described her as a very dynamic and engaging speaker with a sense of humor and certainly lots of life experience to bring to the table. After Rabichuk has concluded speaking, there will be a question and an answer period. 
During this time, anyone in attendance is welcome to ask questions. However, questions may also be submitted beforehand. All questions submitted via this method are kept anonymous. A box of sorts will be present at this event for this purpose, but questions are also welcome via email ahead of the event by contacting Miles for Mental Health at Miles for Mental Health at gmail.com. A variety of printed resources will also be available at the event for anyone who wishes to take them home. Interested parties are asked to RSVP, if possible, to give Miles for Mental Health an idea of attendance. If this is well received, we would definitely plan future similar events, said Martin. Uh, here's a sports event. Uh, NAC, NACI Tigers unable to upend Dauphin in RMFL. The Nipah Area Collegiate Institute Tigers put in a great effort on Saturday, October 7th against the Dauphin Clippers, but still came away with the loss falling 27 to 12. This loss drops NACI's Tiger, I'm sorry, Tigers record to 0 and 5 on the year. The Tigers final regular season game is on the road on Friday, October the 13th versus the Interlake Thunder. Okay, so more sports events. Titans cl lose close one to Nighthawks by Owen Devereaux. It was a game that the Nipua Titans probably deserved to win, but sometimes deserve has nothing to do with the end result. Despite putting in a solid 60-minute effort and at times outplaying their rivals, Nipua fell to the Niverville Nighthawks 3-2 on Saturday, October the 7th. The Titans outshot Niverville 42-34 and also created several quality opportunities over the course of the game. Nighthawks goaltender Raiden Legal was able to keep Nipua at bay, however, and lifted his team to victory. While Carter McLeod was the lone scorer for Nipua on the night, collecting both goals, there were still several players in our hometown, black and gold, that had chances but were bested by Legal. After the game, Titans assistant coach Zach Hicks said that he felt as though the team did everything they needed to win but just didn't, simply didn't get rewarded for the effort. Everything was going well. Our players were controlling things but they didn't get the result they earned or deserved out there, stated Hicks. It's one of those where the coaching staff was happy with effort. You're really happy with what the fellas gave. You're just a little disappointed in the balances that kind of happened and a couple little details we missed. But overall, you're happy with the 60 minutes that the guys gave out there. We created a lot of chances, but unfortunately it didn't sort of work for us out there. Hicks added that over the course of a 58-game season, every team will have these kind of gains, and Saturday's game was just Nipua's turn. So there's a picture here of Nipua's uh, Awen Poye and Michael DeBrito of Niverville. They're focused on the puck in the Titans zone during the second period of Saturday's MJHL game at the Yellowhead Center. The Niverville Nighthawks would end the night with a 3-2 win. And another Titans, uh, Titans shout out Stampeders in Tuesday Night Tussle by Owen Devereaux. The hard work and focus the Nipua Titans have been leaving out there on the ice was rewarded on Tuesday, October the 10th, in the form of a 2-0 victory over the Swan Valley Stampeders. This game was a very closely contested battle between a pair of clubs that were looking to prove themselves early this season. In the first period, it remained scoreless, with both teams registering 12 shots on goal. 
In terms of pace, Nipua controlled the tempo early with several chances within the first six minutes of play. Swan Valley settled in, however, by the midway mark of the first and started creating a few scoring chances of their own. In the second period, Cody Gwinnison opened the scoring for the Titans with a nice spinorama and shot in front of the net to secure, secure his first of the season at 8.33 of the period. In the third period, Nipua took advantage of a 5 on 3 power play chance with Cooper Kasprick notching his first goal of the year. From there, Mason Lebro shut things down in net for Nipua, stopping all 31 shots he faced for the win. Final shots on goal for the game were 43 to 31 for Nipua. Next up for the Titans is a game versus the Weiwei Sakapo Wolverines on Friday, October 13th at the Yellowhead Centre. Start time is set for 7.30 p.m. So make sure you come out and rally on the boys. So for the MJHL standings at this point in time, Nipua Kings is in first place with 10 points. Nipua Titans in second place with eight points. Verdant Oil Capital, seven points. Weiwei Wolverine, six points. And Swan Valley Stampeders and OCN Blizzard tied for four points. Of course, this is the Western Division. Now we have a large article here about the Nipua Area Health Auxiliary. 120 years and still going strong, submitted by the Nipua Area Health Auxiliary. In 1902, J.J. Hamilton and J.A. Davidson convinced the people of Nipua and surrounding area that there was a need for a new hospital in Nipua. In 1903, a group of ladies got together to form the Women's Health Aid Society or WHAS, who invested in some bonds to help with the construction of the 20-bed hospital that would open in 1904. Well, that didn't take long. By the end of the war in 1946, many hospital auxiliaries had folded, but the Nipua Area Health Auxiliary, WHAS, continued to be active. In the early 1950s, another new hospital was built to replace the original one. This hospital is the current Nipua Health Centre and the NAHA provided equipment and furnishings for this building. In 2021, the government announced Nipua would be getting a new hospital and in 2023, construction began. 120 years later, a group of ladies now known as the Nipua Area Health Auxiliary, NAHA, are still working to help with the construction and furnishing of the new hospital and have invested their money in GICs that will go towards a special project in the new hospital. It, for example, furnishing a family room, etc. They continue buying new or replacement equipment for the existing hospital, personal care home, and community programs like public health, home care, and mental health. In the beginning, the WHAS was more involved with the physical running of the hospital, like they made bed linens, pajamas, gowns for the patients, helped with the canning of vegetables and fruit with the kitchen staff, but over the years, rules and regulations have changed to the point that the NAHA raises funds for such things and are not as involved with day-to-day -day operations. One would think that the health authorities do or should purchase any equipment needed, but that is pretty much impossible for them to do when there are 73 facilities in Prairie Mountain Health. So they do rely on donation dollars a lot. Some things you may not have realized. If you had lap laparoscopic surgery at the Nipua Health Centre, the first laparoscopic equipment was purchased by the Health Auxiliary. Or if you are sitting in one of the chairs in the lab where they draw your blood, 
the health auxiliary purchased some of those chairs. Or when you get your blood pressure taken on a machine or your temperature with an electronic, electronic thermometer, the health auxiliary bought some of those for the staff to use. Or the nice roast beef you got for supper was probably cut with the meat slicer the auxiliary bought for the kitchen. Or if you're waiting at the health unit for an appointment, the health auxiliary bought the waiting room chairs and many more things without having to dig deep into the records of the auxiliary over the last 10 years they have spent $121,675 on equipment and furnishings for our for, for our facilities and programs in many years past one of the fundraisers was to sell memberships to the businesses. Now the auxiliary members canvass the businesses in the town of Nipua and in the surrounding RMs as their major fundraiser for the year. All monies received through this is spent on equipment in consultation with the managers of the facilities. In days gone by, the WHAS sold tickets on a hope chest that was stopped when the cedar chest became too expensive. So they went to a smaller jewelry box with the $50 check in it. Today, the auxiliary members sell tickets on monetary prizes of $500, $300, and $200. Teas have always been a popular way to show appreciation to the community for their support. It used to be held at the bamboo restaurant in the banquet room, but we outgrew that and now it is at the Legion. We accept donations made in the memory of a loved one or general donations and all donations will be given a tax receipt. As we near the end of 2023 and anyone needs a tax deduction, please keep us in mind. The Health Auxiliary is not all about raising funds. Being we are a health auxiliary, we feel it is important to educate people on health-related topics. In the past, they have held sessions on STARS, MAID, navigating through your cancer journey, healthcare directives, etc. The auxiliary also gives a $1,000 scholarship to a graduating student from the Nipua Area Collegiate who will be attending a health-related faculty or looking to help alleviate the staffing crisis in health care. These are all funded through different activities that the members participate in, like helping at a Legion supper through the sale of items in the gift cupboard at the health care center, etc. NAHA was formerly a member of the Manitoba Health Auxiliary Association, the MHAA, which was formed at the end of the Second World War in 1946. In 2016, MHAA came to an end and we are now operate independently as NAHA. Our auxiliary has 54 paid up members and always looking for new people to join our organization. We meet seven times a year at 11.30 a.m. at the Legion Hall, and the Legion ladies provide us with a delicious lunch. We hope that you will join us at our two upcoming events. The first one is the education session on MAID and palliative care at the Legion Hall on Tuesday, October the 10th from 1 to 4. Cookies and coffee and tea to follow. And number two, the annual tea at the Legion Hall on Wednesday, October the 25th from 1 to 4 p.m. Men are more than welcome to attend these two events. Good to know. Next, we have an article about Lang Ruth holding its eighth annual Harvest Festival submitted by the Nipah Banner and Press.
On September the 9th, the 8th annual Lang Ruth Harvest Festival was held at the Lang Ruth Sports Grounds. The weather was perfect for a fun day. Visitors from the local area and neighboring communities attended. All the favorite activities were back. The signature large round hay bale jumping area, Dawn's small animal petting zoo, the bouncy castles, the hay ride, archery, old fashioned races, crafts, paint, face painting and more. Don Winthrop has brought his petting zoo to six out of eight of our festivals. There was no petting zoo in 2020 and 2021 due to public health restrictions. Don has decided to retire and make this his last year. Thank you to Don for always joining us and for a generous donation of $50 to a draw for anyone who could name all his animals. Veronica Clark was the lucky winner this year. New this year was the touch a truck area. A variety of vehicles and equipment were available for everyone to see up close. Lakeview Fire Department brought a fire truck and side by side, the municipality of Westlake Gladstone brought the municipal grader. Donnie Smith brought a bombardier. Tom Tychrobe brought a tractor. Nipua Gladstone Co-op brought fuel trucks. Hool Towing brought a tow truck. And the RCMP and Manitoba First Nations Police Service brought service vehicles. So thank you to everyone who contributed to the Touch a Truck area. In addition to the hay ride this year, children could take a ride in the barrel train. Thanks to the Gladstone District Museum for the use of the barrel train and thanks to Harry Laser for being conductor for the day. Also know, new this year was a graffiti station. Thank you to Lauren Hunt for providing the car for the children to paint their hearts away on. A big thanks to Janie Ferguson for running the new graffiti station. Children of all ages were challenged to pull a tractor in the tractor pull challenge. Children aged six and under began pulling on the rope. Age groups were added until there were about 35 people pulling before the tractor finally moved. Great teamwork. Admission to the Harvest Festival is free. Fundraisers and donations help fund the many free activities throughout the day. Thank you to Nipua Gladstone Co-op, Simplot, Richardson Pioneer, and the GWB Auto Sales for donations to the canteen and prizes. Tickets for the 2023 Harvest Festival raffle and last ball standing bingo were available for purchase, and the cow patty bingo squares were auctioned off by auctioneer Tyler Slowinski. There was a bit of a longer wait for the patty <laughs> to drop this year, but it did finally drop on the square bought by Levi Slowinski, who won $650, which was 50% of the sales. Draws for the last ball standing bingo were won by Tina Kreiser, Kreiser and Carissa Egelson. They had chosen the bingo balls that were drawn out of the bingo machine last. Over 600 raffle tickets were sold. The lucky winners were Everly Scora, winning the gift card pack, Marcus Hannison, winning the gas fire pit, and chairs and Melanie, oh, the gas fire pit and chairs, and Melanie Lavely winning the paddle board and kids pack. Congratulations to the winners. Thank you to everyone that contributed to the Lang Ruth Harvest Festival in any way. The commitment of community volunteers makes this event possible each year. Thank you to all those who attended. It is always a wonderful community gathering and we are looking forward to the 24 Langruth Harvest Festival. And here is a picture of a horse and buggy and they provided rides and they were a popular part of the uh, Langruth Harvest Festival activities this year. Now, Moments in Riding Mountain Fall Roundup by Ken Kingdon. We've been spending more time out and about in Riding Mountain 
National Park this fall and have noticed a mishmash of interesting items that might be served up in a fall roundup. Without a heavy killing frost, the autumn colors have been spectacular and long lasting. I suspect that humans are the only ones enjoying such a warm fall. As an example, most of the bears look fat and sassy, and given that the oaks produced a huge number of acorns this year, I suspect that many of our local bears migrated over to the escarpment to take in one of their last large meals before the winter arrives. The oak mast crop, a fancy name for nut crop, comes on the heels of a summer where the berry and nut crops were fairly variable. The hazels didn't produce very many nuts and the few that grew were quickly harvested by squirrels and chipmunks. Wild Saskatoons in the local area were also a disappointment, but the choke cherries more than made up for them. We were away for a 10 day spell in early August and when we left the bushes were laden with ripe fruit, but when we returned, there was nary a berry to be seen. Whether they were eaten by feathered or furred wildlife or both, it must have been a treat after a long, nearly fruitless July. Our mountain ash has done well too, and the robins and wax wings, along with an interesting mix of other small birds, are starting to harvest the berries. Finally, the very last of the bear's meals Hawthorn apples seem to be in good abundance. Generally, these berries are eaten later in the fall, especially after a couple of frosts, provided, providing dessert for bears before they enter their dens for the winter. I always wince when I think of bears harvesting hawthorn fruit. The hawthorns are so well protected by their sharp thorns that the bears, no matter how cautious, will likely pay a price for each berry they eat. Going from the big and furry to the small and cold-blooded, I heard from a lot of folks about the recovery of the local leopard fraud frog population. The cause of their disappearance many years ago remains a mystery, just as is their current recovery. I'm just glad that they are making such a strong comeback. I've also noticed that the local wood duck population appears to be increasing each year. The fancy colored males are easy to spot in the fall, and while I haven't seen any females with young in the park, I suspect that it won't be long before these beautiful ducks are present throughout the summer. What has been missing, though, is an abundance of elk and moose sign. We heard some nice elk bugling in the north part of the bison, bison enclosure, but the calling was confined to this area. We didn't hear any bugles further afield, especially in areas where in past years we would have expected to hear at least a few calling. The moose have been equally elusive, and while I have seen a couple of wall wallows, they too have been pretty shy. The highlight to date was the spotting of a four-year-old bull at Moon Lake wandering the shoreline. I still hope to be able to get out and see some more rutting behavior yet this fall. Some nature notes. While out for a run, I spotted the goofiest thing. I spooked a pine marten that had been in the long grass beside the trail. This does not happen very often. And what happened next was even rarer. The pine marten climbed up a relatively small aspen, stopping at a notch in the tree about four meters above the ground. It hissed and snorted at me, obviously unimpressed without being disturbed. So I decided I had better move down the trail so it would calm down. I stopped in a shaded spot where I could still watch the marten but where it couldn't easily see me. I watched it for quite a while as it moved along the branches of the tree, apparently having forgotten all about me. After a couple of minutes, it wedged its back hips in a tree notch and hung upside down as if it was looking for something in the grass below. The marten grew very still with its tail and 
back legs dangling downward, and if I didn't know any better, I would have thought it was dead. Surely to goodness it, it hadn't just fallen asleep. Science demanded that I confirm my hypothesis. I quietly sneaked up the trail so that I could get a gander at its head on the other side of the tree. Sure enough, the marten's head and front paws were limply dangling down too, its eyes tightly shut. It was definitely sleeping. I tiptoed back down the trail so as not to disturb it. When I got back to my observation spot, I noticed that the marten had started to stir. Nap time was over, and a nap it was, as I don't think the marten was asleep for more than five minutes. I continued with my run, amazed at what I had just seen, recognizing that these sorts of things are happening all the time in nature, but that were usually not in the right place at the right time. I felt fortunate to have a sneak peek into one small part of the daily life of this wild animal. Ken Kingdon lives in Onanol, in the heart of the Riding Mountain Biosphere Reserve. Shoot him a text at 204-848-5020 if you have stories to share. All right. I was just talking about uh, this uh, comedian that is coming to Nipawa. So here's a, a, a longer um, article about him. Effortle effortlessly funny C comedy personality Matt Falk to perform in Nipawa, submitted by the Kaleidoscope Concert Series. The Kaleidoscope 2023-24 season starts with comedian Matt Falk, a writer and actor who the CBC called effortlessly funny. You may have heard of Matt on Sirius Satellite Radio, Laugh Out Loud, and The Debaters. His dry bar comedy special has millions of views collectively online, and three of his comedy albums reach number one on the iTunes comedy charts. You've seen him at the The Ha Halifax Comedy Festival, the Winnipeg Comedy Festival, and the prestigious Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal. Matt was named one of the best of the fest at the Burbank Comedy Festival in California, and he placed second in the World Series of Comedy in Las Vegas. Matt is performing at Arts Forward October the 27th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Beverages are available for purchase. Tickets may be purchased at Arts Forward, Eventbrite, or at the door. Don't miss out on the chance to see Matt Falk in live in action. Matt is excited to perform in Nipua at Arts Forward. Prepare yourself for a night of non-stop entertainment and belly laughs. Cost per ticket is $20, and if you're a K-12 student under 18, it will be $5 at the door. Thank you to Gill and Schmall Agencies for sponsoring this event. We appreciate your generosity, which makes bringing talent like Matt to our town possible. <clears throat> 60 Years of Community and Growth, the Westoba Way. October 3rd, 2023 marks a momentous milestone for Westoba as they celebrate their 60th year in business. Through their un the unwavering support of their loyal members, they have flourished into one of the most successful credit unions in Manitoba. They owe this success to their members and to show their heartfelt appreciation, they embarked on a journey of giving back to Manitoba communities, exemplifying the, Man the Westoba way. This year, as part of their commitment to community, a total of 60,000 dollars will be given away through the Westoba Inspire Fund supporting projects that contribute to the development of community infrastructure. At West Westoba they believe that investing in your community is not just a duty but a privilege. Our journey spanning over six decades of dedication to our members and communities underscores the profound impact a financial institution can have when it places people at its core, says Jim Rediger, Westoba's president and CEO. Just as we have grown, evolved, and embraced innovation, 
we've seen the communities we serve flourish and members thrive. Westova's commitment extends beyond its members to the community it serves, championing initiatives like sharing financial expertise at local schools and immigration centres, through financial literacy programs, sponsoring community and culture events, and the smart sponsorship of infrastructure like Westoba Place and Westoba Agriculture Center of Excellence in Brandon. Giving back is deeply rooted in Westoba's values and cooperative principles, a commitment known as the Westoba Way. In 2017, Westoba introduced the Westoba Inspire Community Investment Program an initiative designed to provide provincial support to communities seeking to create positive, sustainable change. This program has funded more than 35 multifunctional projects aiding numerous community organizations across this Prairie Province with funding totaling over $2 million. Sorry, $200,000. <laughs> In keeping with their commitment to continuous improvement, Westoba took a significant step this year by seeking feedback from their members, employees and dedicated teams. The goal was to redefine its purpose, mission, vision and values to better reflect the evolving needs and aspirations to all stakeholders. This collaborative effort resulted in a powerful set of guiding principles that will hopefully shape Man uh, Westoba for the next 60 years. We are proud of our journey and our corporate statement. It goes beyond pro providing financial services, but to our commitment to community and our people, shares Garnet McBurney, Chair of Westoba's Board of Directors. As we celebrate this anniversary, I am confident that our best days are yet to come. Westoba invites all members, partners, and community members to join in the festivities on October the 19th, 2023, to celebrate this milestone, the 75th anniversary of International Credit Union Day serves as the perfect occasion to reflect on the incredible journey of Westoba and its unwavering commitment to members and where they live and work. Drop by any Westoba branch where refreshments will be served and staff members will be available to chat. It's an opportunity for everyone to share their stories, celebrate the credit union's remarkable journey as they forge toward together with the future. Manitoba, Westoba looks forward to sharing the next 60 years with you. All right, Home Bodies by Rita Friesen. It's entitled, I Eeked. Walking calmly down the street with Ari, my dog of choice, we were startled by a quick movement in the pile of dead leaves that lined the street. Darting out was a little brown squirrel. It saw the dog, mistook my leg as a, sa as a safe tree and hurtled toward me. I eeked. I am not an eeker, but the thought of a squirrel climbing my leg to who knows where caused an involuntary outburst. Enough of an outburst for the woodland creature to reassess its own safety and scurry to a real tree, much to my relief. I was surprised by my reaction and spent some time reflecting on what startles me and under what conditions. I don't like mice. I can set a snap trap and release the victim when needed. I could pursue one around a confined space if necessary. I really don't like snakes. I'm, I mean, I really don't like snakes. I have maintained that I am not afraid of them, just don't like being spooked by one of their sinuous movements, usually unannounced. I had to put that theory down the day Ari, Ari picked up the dried up carcass of a snake on one of our walks. The command, drop it, had no effect, no matter the pitch or volume of the command. So what to do? She was not putting it down. 
and I was not going to go home with it. After a desperate standoff on Railway Street, I remembered the doggy drop bag in my pocket. It was still unused. Not that that would have been the determining, determining factor in my decision. I placed the bag over my hand and firmly tugged the scaly specimen out of her mouth and won the prize to the distance for a toss of a snake skin. So, it wasn't the movement that disturbed me or even a live snake that upset me. It was the very idea that a snake had freaked me out. It's a very natural reaction to let out a squeal or a squeal or a full-blown yell when startled. It's just not something I do very often. I'll admit when I eked for that squirrel, I did a quick shoulder check to see if there were any witnesses. You know that feeling, missed a step and almost fell. Did anyone see that? Or drop a piece of food in a public library and try to nonchalantly keep working, walking. There are all kinds of situations when we hope desperately that no one really saw what happened. The incident did bring to mind the evening that we moved into the big house on the acreage east of town. I had left the patio doors open as I carried load after endless load into the house. On one of these trips, I walked into a closed door. <laughs> Ed explained too quietly that the light had attracted insects and a rather large one had got into the house. A rather large insect? Oh, it was a bloody big bat. I eked proper that time. If their flight is by sonar, I disturbed its flight pattern for a significant amount of time. Yep, there's a time and a place for a good loud eek. Bouncing Back, Faithfully Yours by Neil Strohshine. During the summer months, the highway between McBride and Prince George, BC takes travelers through some of the most beautiful country in the world. It also allows them to see how nature renews itself following a wildfire or a natural disaster. I lived in Prince George for four years and drove that route at least six times a year. I will never forget one scene from those trips. I first passed it one year after it had been infested with a beetle that laid its eggs in the bark of spruce trees. There was only one way to keep the infestation from destroying the whole forest, and that was to cut down every tree in the infected area. Forestry officials determined the extension of the infestation, and the work began. In a very short time, not one tree of any kind was still standing. But now, the real work began. The area was tilled. A grid was laid out and crews of summer workers planted seedlings to replace the trees that were cut down. Later that year, as I drove by that site, I saw a hillside covered with brilliant pink flowers. In a few weeks, the flowers were replaced with huge fluffy heads that looked like dandelions, only a dozen times larger. These plants, I would soon learn, were called fireweed. When I first saw these plants, I wondered why they hadn't been sprayed. I couldn't understand what useful purpose these weeds, as I called them, could serve. I was quickly shown the error in my thoughts. These plants, I learned, were nature's way of protecting tree seedlings during their initial growing stages. They helped trap and moisture hold the moisture. They protected the seedlings from the hot summer sun, and being legumes, they took harmful elements from the air and converted them into nutrients that helped the seedlings grow into healthy trees. Once the seedlings were big enough to survive on their own, the fireweed stopped growing. Its seeds lay dormant in the place where they fell, waiting until those trees were either harvested for lumber or destroyed in a wildfire, after which they would sprout and grow to protect a new batch of seedlings. But this Alberta farm boy had much more to learn about BC forests and forestry. One of the first things I learned was that forest fires, 
like those that have swept through parts of BC this year aren't all bad. They release tree seeds from the covers that protect them and removing the thick layer of thatch that has covered the ground so that the seeds can fall to the ground and begin to grow. I was quite impressed by what I heard. These processes have been with us since the beginning of time. They are God's way of helping nature renew itself of helping its bounce. Back after natural disasters in a perfect world, such things would not exist. But ours is not a perfect world. Fires, floods, droughts, famines and disease these are common to life in all parts of our world. We try to control them, but quickly discover that we can't. All we can do is sit quietly and watch in amazement as the earth renews itself, something I did many times while on that road between McBride, BC and Prince George, and something I continue to do whenever I see the new life that comes when an abundant rain ends a lengthy dry spell. God has built this resilience into his creation. It is one of his many blessings, blessings I am counting during this Thanksgiving season. So here we have quite the potato. We talked about potatoes in last week's uh, paper. So hopefully you can see this one. It's called the Great Potatosaurus. An individual from the area unearthed a peculiar fossil recently. Pictured here is one, uh, one might initially think that something with this particular shape would be some fresh ginger. However, it is actually a potato. This potato dinosaur or potatosaurus <laughs> was dug up in the McCreary area. This individual who brought in this odd tuber wished to remain anonymous, adding with good humor that they wanted to avoid any potential dinosaur hunters from coming around. Well, that is hilarious. So for our thumbs up, thumbs down this week, we have two thumbs up. A thumbs up to all the generous gardeners who shared their veggies and fruit with the residents of Elks Manor. Manor. It was very appreciated by Jody Birch of Nipua. A huge thumbs up to Paul Adrianson and his crew for picking and giving away the excess potatoes for free on Monday, October the 9th. It was so great just to go to the piles of potatoes on the field and pick as much as one wanted. Thank you, Paul and Kim. That was greatly appreciated by Larry Novak, also of Nipua. Now we just have a few moments left uh, for this broadcast, so I don't think we have enough time to read Ken Waddell's article, but I'll just read a couple of uh, excerpts from Looking Back which goes back to 125 years ago on October the 12th, 1898. Lunn and company propose opening a branch of their Nipua confectionery and fruit business in Carberry. S. Johns will look after the Carberry end. 100 years ago on October the 12th, 1923, in Franklin, the Chautauqua program for this Friday afternoon and evening includes the famous Ploner Yodeling Serenaders. Also a lecture on Australia, the world's curiosity shop. Also in Franklin, Dr. Code left on Monday for Winnipeg where he has taken up practice. In Brookdale, Lester McLeod and Will Gray are wandering like a knight's the knights of old in search of adventure and treasure. It is rumored, however, that a touring car takes the place of the rampant steeds of old. They are now at Strathclair. In Edrin's, Duranges School has a new teacher, Miss Rita Olton, who comes from Portage La Prairie, highly recommended, and has made a very favorable first impression. 
in 75 years ago, Kenneth Wilkie, this is in 1948, Kenneth Wilkie has been appointed manager of the rink for the 1948-49 skating season. A new shop, a new showroom, a new business, a new rendezvous for farmers and citizens alike will all be presented to Nipois when I.O. Hansen opens his new farm implement store here on Saturday. Situated on Mountain Avenue, Nipois, um, a fine new building, the steady progress of Nipois have watched with considerable interest during recent month. A former Arden resident, William Herbert McBean of Norwood, passed away at Grace Hospital on Tuesday, October the 5th. Born in Bellino County, Mayo, Ireland, Mr. McBean came to Canada in 1907 and took up residence in Winnipeg and was engaged in the grocery business until 1924 when he took up farming in the Arden district south of town. Since then, he has been employed by the T. Eaton Company in the meat department. <laughs> 20 years ago, October 2003, hundreds turned out for the grand opening of the McCreary Legion after the organizing, organization gave the community a major vote of confidence in the future by building a new hall. Despite often heated controversy, more than 36 communities across Canada have banned indoor smoking to only 20 years ago in public places while many others are considering it. In recognition of this courageous and progressive step, the Canadian Medical Association recently presented its first annual award for excellence in health promotion to these communities through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Wow. Well, that is it for this week's edition of the Nipah Banner and Press. Thank you for joining me and hopefully we'll see you next week or another day for sure. So bye for now.